Well, good morning, everyone. Let's try that again. Good morning, everyone. It is so good to see everyone here this this morning on this cold, rainy morning, but nothing's going to stop us from giving praise and honor to our Lord Jesus. Amen? Amen. If you're visiting with us for the first time, be it here or by live stream, we want you to know that we are so happy that you are here to be with us this morning to worship our Lord and Savior. God is good, and all the time, let's all stand as we sing, He Lives. Aren't you glad that He is alive this morning? That he is alive and that he is working, even working really hard this morning. He is alive this morning. One, three, one, two, three, four. Is she on? There we go. One, two. you glad that this morning that he has saved you this morning that he lives in your heart hallelujah hallelujah let's all sing open the eyes of my heart open the eyes of my heart Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. 
give the Lord a hand this morning, for he is holy. Holy, holy is our Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Well, we are glad that many of you braved the weather to come out to our worship services this morning. Some that are watching us by faith, Facebook and YouTube, I'm sure that uh, you're warm and cozy in your house. And we're warm and cozy here and hoping that we can have a safe trip home. Amen. Uh, right now it's just raining and I know it's warm enough that we're hopefully it'll just stay that way. Uh, we, I know it's a good mixture. We have off and on that today. So thank you for, for coming out today. And, and those of you that stayed home, we pray that you'll, you'll be safe as well. Thank you for watching us on Facebook Live. We appreciate that too. Amen. Um, we have our bulletin and I just want to remind you of a few things that are in there. For, first of all, today after the service, uh, if you are interested in helping out with children, the children's ministry in any way possible, Brother Matt is going to have a meeting after the church service uh, just for a few minutes uh, to talk with those that are interested uh, and uh, see if you can help out with the, the uh, children's ministry, and he'll give you some ways that you can help out there. Ladies' brunch, Saturday, the January the 22nd at 10 a.m. in the Fellowship Hall. Uh, we'd like to invite all ladies for that. Uh, don't forget the Discovering Grassy Valley class. We've already gone through two weeks of it, but uh, it's not too late to join. You can catch up by watching us online. We have it on our website, grassyvalley.org, and you can catch up by watching those first two lessons online. The Baptist Men's Group, we have a men's breakfast January the 29th at Don Delphi's Restaurant in Farragut, which is right down the street close to the entrance to the Farragut High School. And uh, if you'd like to meet with us that morning, it's a great breakfast. I enjoy being, spending time with the men and just uh, fellowshipping there. Uh, don't forget that the Bible studies that are still going on on Wednesday nights, we're still doing uh, some Bible studies there. My wife is teaching Elijah, and I'm teaching No More Excuses. And uh, these are great video series that we're going through, great discussions, great Bible learning, and great study. By the way, the Martins are coming in concert the last Sunday of this month. No relation, again, but they are fantastic. Fantastic, fantastic musicians. If you get a chance to watch some of their stuff on YouTube, I encourage you, just get on YouTube and watch some of their performances. You will be amazed at their harmony. They're going to be coming this the last Sunday of this month on the 30th. We're privileged to have them. Also, the Tennessee Right to Life Sunday, January 28th, March for Life. That's going to be at the Knoxville Convention Center. If you'd like to be a part of that, I think they start at 2 o'clock. And uh, there's a lot of things going on. A lot of things happening in our church, and I just want to appreciate. I just want to tell you how much I love you. I tell you how much that I love you. And, and, and those of you that stayed home, I, I love you, and I'm so glad that you're part of our church. Uh, we have been blessed, and we're seeing miracles every week. We had a man come this week, uh, and I know I talk a lot about the food pantry, but there's other ministries going on. We have the, we have the uh, Quilting for Cause, and we have other ministries happening that are just really taking hold. And uh, we, we bought a food truck this or food trailer this week that uh so i was telling gave you a tease last week uh brother kent had had a burden on his heart that we needed to buy a food truck and start and, and not just to have people come up here for food but be able to take food hot food to some of the homeless that are in the area and serve a hot meal to them and also be able to deliver food and, and to use it for other things other ministries as well like disaster relief and feeding some things people like that so we are excited about what God is doing, the expansion, and God provided the money. And uh, if you would like to still contribute to that, you can, because we still got to fill it with food and uh, fill it with other things. So, um, but it came with all kinds of equipment as well, $3,000 worth of equipment, and the trailer, we only paid $3,500 for it. So unbelievable what God has done and the miracles he's working in our church. But what a blessing. But I'm just going to say this. God is working. He's doing miracles. We had a man stop by the church this week and give us 100 cans of soup. 100 cans of soup. And it wasn't the cheap stuff. We're not talking, we're not talking cheap stuff. We're talking uh, progressive stuff, right? That was the progressive soup. That's the expensive stuff. Uh, but I called him and I said, thank you so much for just being a blessing. This man has been uh, a blessing to our church in so many ways. He doesn't even go here. But he contributes here because he sees the need. And he always seems to answer with the need that we have the most need for. I mean, if we have a need for beans, he brings beans. We don't contact him or call him. He just, just, he's just he got a direct line or something to the Lord, and he's listening. And he brings in what we need the most. And so 
God has blessed in so many. We're seeing miracle after miracle after miracle every week. If you don't believe in Jesus Christ, I'm going to tell you something. You need to stick around here for a while. You will believe in Jesus Christ because of the miracles that we're seeing. Amen? I cannot believe there's people leaving uh, the, this denomination, people that are leaving uh, the whole uh, relationship with Jesus Christ. They're just leaving it because they, oh, I don't believe in miracles. He doesn't do miracles anymore. Well, you need to come here and see the miracles God is doing because God is doing miracles here every week. He is true. He's alive, and we believe in him. Amen? Amen. By the way, the renovation budget, we're down to $1,600. $1,700, that's all we owe. If the pastor hadn't have gone over so much with the renovation, we'd have thing paid off by now, you know? I'll tell you what, God has done some great things. We're already almost paying that thing off. God blessed this church. He has blessed this church in so many ways. We're glad that you're with us this morning. Those of you that are here, thank you so much for braving with us. Stand together. Let's just welcome each other. Shake hands with those around you. And we'll say hello to all those that are visiting us on Facebook and YouTube. Good. Thank you for being with us this morning. God's people said, amen. This is a come to a time of, in our worship service where we worship the Lord by giving. I was talking to uh, our, our class this morning in discovering Grassy Valley about worship, and, and we're going to be talking about worship today in the sermon. I'm not going to try to give you a preview of anything, but we're going to be talking about worship today. Worship is more than just singing. Now, singing is just an avenue of worship, uh, but worship is also in our actions and how we uh, live our life, but also worship is in giving. And we want to worship the Lord by giving back to him what he's given to us and being faithful to be tithers. 
And if you're visiting with us online, you can give also on our website. I fail to mention that each week, but you can give on our website. There's an app that you can download as well and give to our church electronically. I've learned a long time ago. How many have your checkbook with you? Raise your hand. Okay, one, two, three, four. Okay, we're still in the church that carries checkbooks, but if, if, you, if you were to go to another church with younger people in it, you'd say, how many have your checkbook? Nobody would raise their hand. But if you say, how many have your smartphone with you? They'd all raise their hand. So how many have your smartphone with you? Okay, a lot more hands went up. Uh, you can give through your smartphone. You can give through an app that we have. And uh, what's that app called again, Alan? Nothing like putting you on the spot, is there? He'll find it. <laughs> He's looking it up, by the way. Go ahead. Edit it this out, would you? Okay. Those of you that are watching live, you can't edit it. but It's okay. You can go to our website and find it, can't you? Okay. Go to our website, grasslyvalley.org, and you can find that app, and it gives you instructions on how to get there. And you can give through the app. Uh, so if you don't have a checkbook, you can always give through your phone. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you, Lord, even for the weather. And, Father, we do pray that you'll give us safety as we go home. Uh, we pray that you'll just keep us safe on the roads, keep us safe as we walk to our houses. Uh, Lord, we just pray that uh, as we worship you this morning, that you will be honored in all that we do, all that we say. Well, Lord, that's the reason we're here, is to honor and praise and glorify you. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to be in your house. And I pray that you'll bless this offering for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand as we continue singing for our Lord. Let me stay. 
so glad that this morning that his grace knows no limits because of what he did and he shed his grace on us our chains are broken our chains are gone we're set free from our sins how many of you are so thankful that he has set you free from your sins this morning he is worthy of all of our praise he is worthy of it all what amazing grace Dissolve like snow, the sun. 
amazing grace. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Amen. Thank you, Brother Nathan. If you've got your Bibles, go ahead and turn to John, please, if you would. John chapter 2. John chapter 2, I'm excited about preaching this passage this morning, and I was telling my wife last night, you know, I was going back through it and working on some new things, God was continuing to speak to me, and I said, I'm going to have to make this into a two-parter, it's just too much information for me to give in one sermon, so guess what, you get a two-part sermon. John chapter 20, verse 31, just hold your place there in John chapter 2, but let me remind you, John chapter 20, verse 31, but these things have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Everything that John has been writing, and you're going to hear me quote this scripture every Sunday, hopefully, if I don't forget. But I hope to quote quote that passage every Sunday, and I hope that you will commit it to memory. This is John's purpose in writing the book, the gospel. Again, but these things have been written. This is why he tells, he says, I've written these things for two purposes. One is apologetic. We call apologetic in the fact that he is writing it so, giving you evidence that Jesus is deity, that Jesus is the Son of God. And the other purpose is for evangelism, so that you may believe, and in believing you will have everlasting life. So this is a purpose of why he's writing this book. He wants to prove Jesus is the Son of God, and then by proving it that you'll believe, and in believing you'll have everlasting life. Isn't that what we are to be about? Amen? Now this morning I want to come today to another miracle. Last Sunday we talked about God, Jesus Christ, turning the water into wine. Remember the miracle at the wedding feast there in Canaan? Remember that? What a beautiful miracle. It's a miracle for his family and for his friends and for a select group of people. But today we're going to see another miracle, a miracle that we often overlook. In fact, I doubt very seriously that many of us have read this and said, wow, that's an amazing miracle. Because, honestly, church, I'm not saying that you're any different than I am, but I've never read it this way. I've never seen this passage in the light that I'm about to share it to you this morning because God showed me something this week. It was amazing through the, and this, and I'm not the smartest man in the world, but I've, I'm standing on other people's shoulders, don't get me wrong. I'm, I, some things that I've read this week, it just opened up my eyes about this passage that just blew me away. It's a miracle that we often overlook, we don't even see it. And I want you to see it this morning, a miracle that is of mammoth proportions. What is this miracle about? Well, this miracle is about worship. It's about Jesus and his passion for true worship. His passion is to keep it pure and undefiled. Why? Because the people had turned it into something that was unholy and irreverent. Man does not change, does he? What was true back then is often true today. Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun It seems that we continue to carry this on. Even today, we've not made worship what it was truly meant to be. And I'm afraid, church, that God is going to bring judgment upon the churches of America because of our irreverence, our lack of understanding of who He is as a holy God. 
Before we start in John, let me read something to you. And if you want to mark this down to go back and read later, I would encourage you to do so. But to get an idea of where we're going with this, hundreds of years before Jesus comes on the scene, again, man is the same. Man continues to be dis- irreverent and continues to be unholy in their worship. If you go all the way back to Isaiah, back before the captivity in Babylon, you're going to find the same thing. Isaiah chapter 1, in verse 11. Let me just read this to you. I've got it here on the screen so you don't have to turn. But Isaiah chapter 1, verse 11. What are your multiplied sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I've had enough of your burnt offerings and rams and the fat of the fed cattle, and I take no pleasure in the blood of bulls, lambs, or goats. When you come to appear before me, who requires of you this trampling of my courts? Bring your worthless offerings no longer. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath, the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity and the solemn assembly. I hate your new moon festivals and your appointed feasts. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. So, verse 15, when you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Yes, even those, even though you multiply prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are covered with blood. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil of your deeds from my sight. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good, seek justice, reprove the ruthless, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are scarlet, they will be as white as snow. They are, though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. If you consent and obey, you will eat the best of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. Truly, the mouth of the Lord has spoken. All the way back in Isaiah's time, God spoke through Isaiah. God spoke to the people. Something was going on in the temple. Something amiss. Something was really awry with their worship. And this is the same exact issue we're going to be facing this morning. It's an age-old problem of hypocrisy in Israel, false religion, superficial worship. And by the way, it infiltrates Jesus, uh, infiltrates uh, the, the, the people of worship during this time, and it really makes Jesus extremely mad because it's irreverent, it's blasphemous. So turn to John chapter 2, and let's begin in verse 12. After this, he went down to Capernaum. What is after this? Well, we just read last week, after he had turned the water into wine, after he was there in Cana, he travels down to Capernaum, okay, about 12 miles or so. And his mother, he and his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and there they stayed a few days. Verse 13. And the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves, and the money changers seated. And he made a scourge of cords and drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to those who were selling the doves, he said, Take these things away. Stop making my father's house a house of merchandise. His disciples remembered remembered that it was written, zeal for thy house will consume me. We're going to stop right there because I want to dive into this section. Now remember, the Passover was an annual feast, right? Happened every year. It was commemorating the time when the children of Israel were delivered from slavery in Egypt. You remember back in, in, in Exodus, The story, you remember that uh, they were captive by the Egyptians. And remember the very last plague that was coming along. Moses went to all the people and said, 
You need to slaughter a lamb and put the blood over the doorpost and on the sides. A death angel is coming tonight. If you do not do this, the death angel will take your firstborn. But if you put the blood on the doorpost and over the top and eat the lamb, have the supper, have, eat the, the Passover meal, if you will do this, then when the death angel comes tonight, your son, your, your children will be spared. And so the children of Israel obeyed. Those that obeyed, their sons were spared. Those that did not, their, sons were, their firstborn son were, or firstborn child was taken. So here you have a, a, a commemoration. Every year they commemorated this. They called it the Passover or the table, uh, the, 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 un, the feast of the unleavened bread. And in verse 14, Jesus comes to the temple and finds the money changers taking advantage of the people. It had become quite, a common, uh, it become quite common to sell animals for sacrifices. Now this right here, this picture that you're seeing on, on the, the screen is a, is a model. My wife and I had the opportunity to go to Israel, and this is a huge model. You stand there, and you can walk all the way around it, but this was actually a model done by a person that, that, that said this is what Jerusalem and the Herod's temple and all that looked like during Jesus' time. It had become, it had become uh, such a, a wonderful place that you could sit there and look at the temple and see how it was built and see the inner courts and the outer courts and so forth. And, and there were several courtyards to the temple, and I want you to notice this, but I'm going to change the, the slide here because I want you to see the different courtyards because this is important. Each courtyard decreased in the importance to the Jews. First of all, there was the court of the priests. And it's closest to the temple, of course. Uh, only the priests were allowed there. You'd find the altar of burnt, uh, burnt offerings, the bronze washing basin, the seven-branched lamp stand, and the altar of incense and the table of showbread. You would find that all there in the temple and surrounding just a few feet away. That was the court of the priests. And the only piece the people allowed in that were the priests themselves. Then you had the court of the Israelites. This was a huge courtyard where the Jewish worshipers met together for joint services on the great feast day. It was where the worshipers handed over their sacrifice to the priests. Then you had the court of women. Women were usually limited to this area except for joint worshipers worshiping with the men on occasion. They could, however, enter the court of Israelites when they came to make sacrifices or worship in a joint assembly, assembly on a great day or a great feast. But then you also had the court of the Gentiles, and you see that as the biggest part of the, the, the facilities there. It covered a very vast space surrounding all the other courtyards, and it was the place of worship for all Gentiles converted to Judaism. No Gentile was allowed to come into any other courtyard under penalty of death. If you walked into the women's courtyard, if you walked into the Jew courtyard, or the Jewish courtyard, you, you would be put to death if you were a Gentile. It was also the furthest courtyard away from the Holy of Holies. So let me just give you a little background here of what's going on. When Jesus comes to the temple, so bear with me this morning. I'm taking off my preacher hat, putting on my professor's seminary teaching hat, okay? In John chapter 2, verses 14 through 16, let's see what's going on here. In verse 14, he says, And he found in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves, and he found the money changers seated. Now, the number as to the population of Jerusalem at this time is estimated to around 300,000 people. Okay? Now, this is just the average number of the city of Jerusalem which would make it a very big place, a very busy place, a lot of people there already. But according to Josephus, a Jewish historian, at Passover, which was once a year, people would travel from all over the country, all over the nation of Israel, and from other countries to come to Jerusalem. And it's estimated by Josephus that there was 250,000 animal sacrifices on Passover. 250,000 animal sacrifices. Now, 
that may be that may be accurate but it doesn't tell us how many people were there because what Josephus does is he said there's 10 people per sacrifice now are you ready for that one 10 people per sacrifice that's over 2.5 million people that would have been in Jerusalem at that time that's amazing isn't it when you have an average group of people there are about 300,000 people living in the city and now you're going to add all these other hundreds of thousands even millions of people coming in what do you think is going to happen to that city it is overrun it is wall to wall people Every room that could be a room and could be rented out was taken up by somebody. If you had a two-bedroom house and your family lived in it, you moved everybody into one room and you rented out the other room for that week so you could have some people living. And they would probably put their whole family in one room. Everything that could be taken up was taken up. Food, all this was going on. Can you imagine the size of what's taking place during that one week of Passover, during that celebration, people coming in? It's expanded. It goes further and further. Thousands of people would have made their way to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover for the worship of the temple. Some would be coming for the very first time to see the temple. Children making their way to Jerusalem with their parents. Every room taken up. And a focal point of all the activity, the millions of millions or the, the several hundreds of thousands of people, the focal point was the temple. And the temple courtyard, the outside courtyard, the court of the Gentiles, as it was called, would be only a few acres at the time. When Jennifer and I went there, we were able to see the, the whole Herod's temple upper part where the mosque is now. But I was thinking to myself the other day, if, if you had a million people up there, it would be wall to wall, shoulder to shoulder of people. And that's just a million. If you had 2.7 million, as Josephus was telling you can't imagine how many people were there in Jerusalem at that time. It's just overwhelming to me. Now, if Josephus is right and they slaughtered 250,000 animals, all this would take place, you ready for this, on Passover from 3 in the afternoon till 6 in the afternoon, three hours. So in three hours' time, they would slaughter a quarter of a million animals. This may well be true, but by this time, there are some historical indications that people who used to buy and sell outside the temple have now moved into the courtyard area. Here's what's happened. It used to be outside. People would buy and sell animals to come and be a part of this because they learned a long time ago. They learned that if you raised a perfect spotless lamb to bring as your sacrifice... You would take that animal, say, from Capernaum, and you would walk 12, 13, 15 miles all the way to Jerusalem with your family to sacrifice that lamb. And you would get there, and you would present that lamb to the priest. And the priest, during this time, the priest would look at it and go, nah, it's not perfect. You need to go to one of our sellers over there and buy a lamb from them. So what have you done? You've brought a lamb that can't be sacrificed. Now you've got to take money out of your own pocket to buy a lamb that they want you to buy. And, of course, it's going to be like Disney World where you buy a Coke here for a dollar and a half and you go to Disney World and it's 10 or $15, right? It's crazy. They jack up the prices. Why? Because they were making money. This was often called, this was called, and it's, it's written down in historical notes, as the Bazaar of Anast. The Bazaar of Anas was really, Anas was the high priest. And so they called it the Bazaar of Anas because the high priest was making money over hand and fist. He was making a lot of money off of selling goats and sheep and doves and all the things that could be sacrificed. He was making money because every one of those that were selling it had to pay him a tax, a temple tax. Oh, and by the way, if you came with American money, you had to transfer that you had to exchange it over to the temple money oh and there's an exchange rate oh sometimes 10 15 20 percent that they would charge you for exchanging your money so you see what's happening here there's a lot of stuff going on that's 
really underhanded. They're selling animals at exorbitant prices. Their exchange rate is exorbitantly high. So people just stopped bringing their animals and started buying them from them because what's the point of bringing an animal when you know it's going to be rejected anyway? So they come expecting this, and it's become habit. It was the bazaar of an os. I can't imagine the crush of humanity going on and all these people there. Some were there for legitimate reasons. They were there to worship. Some were there to praise. Some were there to praise. I believe a lot of families came with the right intentions, but I believe also when they got there, they realized that there was a lot going on that should not be going on. These money changers are sitting there, sitting at their, at their tables. They're charging exorbitant amount of money for exchange rates. And the experience told them that if they, could, if they could just get enough money, they'd make it rich for that week. They rejected the ones that all the other people brought, all those animals and so forth. And, and everybody paid a temple tax. So this business that's going on, this extortion that's going on, Jesus sees this. Now, please understand, Jesus has been to the Passover every year. Every year. There was not one thing that Jesus did not hold to, according to the law. All the moral law, everything he did. Why? Because his parents held to it. They taught him that. He was also a believer. He was also God, right? The law, he was living by the law, so he went to the Passover every year. John tells us this is the first Passover of his ministry. He also tells us of two other Passovers that happened during his ministry, and then the very last Passover that he comes to, right, is where he becomes the Passover lamb. Now, you add all these people, then I want you to understand that there was also a guard there. There was a temple guard there. The, the priests had their own poli- temple police. So there's about three or 400 of these people that would do, all they would do is walk around the courtyard during this time and keep the peace. They would make sure nothing happened that would be out of the order, nobody getting mad, and they would keep things calmed down. Why? After all, it was there to worship, right? Then add to this, and you see the little air up there, this is Fort Antonia. This is where the Roman in, in, in Fort Antonia, where the temp, the Romans had built it, so they could sit atop and they could watch everything that's going on in the courtyard. So if there was ever any kind of insurrection, any kind of violence going on, they could come down as soldiers and squash it. But most people are there for the right reason, right? They're there to worship. So the temple was well guarded, secure. Jesus sees all this. He's the selling of animals, act, the, the sacrificial animals. The money changing. He sees that they have totally polluted his father's house. Their hearts are the same as the hearts of the people who Isaiah wrote to. They're irreverent. And it should have been a place of repentance, a place of reverence, a place of humility, a place of worship, a place of praise. But in verse 15, he makes the scourge of cords. It doesn't seem much of a weapon, does it, against tens of thousands of people. They all have plenty of reason to resist. They're there to worship, right? Money changers, they're pretty tight about their money. People that are selling oxen and cattle, they have a reason to resist. But I want you to see this. There is no human explanation for what happens. The miracle are in these words. And he drove them all out of the temple. Do you see that? I want you to get this. A miracle that we often overlook is the fact that Jesus, with a scourge of cords, chases them all out. This is so understated that you would often miss it. There's no lightning, there's no thunder, there's no angelic fanfare, there's no trumpet blow. He just drives them all out. Just an imaginable act of power. They leave. All it would have taken is one burly guy to stand up and grab him. All it would have taken is maybe several guys to grab him and hold him down. All it would have taken was the temple police or the Roman soldiers to stop him. But they don't. He drives them all out. He flips over the tables. 
They scramble to get whatever they can and evacuate the place in such an orderly fashion. We don't read of anybody getting hurt. I'm sure people have turned over tables and left in a hurry, but we don't read of anybody getting hurt, not by Jesus. Jesus didn't, didn't hurt anybody with a scourge. He's just swinging it. He's getting the animals out of there. He's making. He's yelling at them, and they're all leaving as quickly as they possibly can. Do you get the picture here? Do you understand the power it takes right here? This is a supernatural, sovereign, powerful God working a miracle amongst thousands of people. Do you get this? He didn't attack the people, he attacked the system. The merchants would want to stop him. The temple police would feel completely responsible to stop him, but they didn't. The Roman guards should have come down from the tower, but they didn't. Why? He is a holy, sovereign righteous God God who in control of everything and everyone and every heart. Now, if you're wondering if something like this had ever happened before in the temple, let me share this with you. There's a book called The Jews at the Time of Jesus. It's written by a man by the name of Wyland. And he says this, such, such incidences were not unusual as trouble in the temple. And he gives a very interesting tale. He says, The high priest was in the temple at one of these events, and the Jews were very unhappy with the high priest, and so they started throwing lemons at him, blasting the high priest with lemons. He unleashes his private mercenaries, his mercenary army, and according to records, slaughtered the people in the courtyard in multiple thousands for throwing lemons at him. That's a far cry than what our Lord did. There are many Jewish records of things happening in the temple, being, people being killed by the sword in the temple, prophets being killed in the temple. And we'll read that in the New Testament as well. Listen, church, this is an unimaginable miracle that you overlook. God drives them out with woven, with woven cords, not a sword. But I want you to get this too. This is the first miracle that Jesus performs publicly. You say, wait a minute, I thought the water of wine was. Jesus performed the miracle of water turning into wine at a wedding for his family and for his friends. When Jesus starts his ministry, he starts it right there at the temple, and he brings judgment upon the temple. When Jesus finishes his ministry, it's at Passover. What does he do the week before he's crucified? He cleanses the temple again, brings judgment upon the people. Is that amazing? Listen, Jesus is sovereign, deity, ruler, God over all things, amen, and hearts of men. In this passage, I want you to see the zeal for the house of God. Listen, Jesus looked and saw what was happening in his father's house. If he were to look right now in the houses across America, the church houses across America, what would Jesus find today? Have you ever asked yourself that question? If he were to look in the houses today, what would he find? What motives would he see in the hearts of men? Jesus didn't attack the people. He attacked the system. It was the religious leaders who had turned it into something it should have never been. It was more about what they could get rather than what they could give. Think about it for a moment. The religious leaders were not about giving God anything. They were all about getting for themselves. They wanted fame. They wanted fortune. They wanted the money. They wanted the respect. It was not about giving to God. And I'm afraid, and I'll say this publicly, I'm afraid across America today, pastors are selling their souls for entertainment. They're selling everything to get 
rather than to give. And we've, come, we've become a showplace rather than a place of worship. And I'm afraid that if God were to come down today, he would be very, Very disappointed, very angry, very hostile to what he's seeing in churches today. But it's not just about churches because we understand that this is not the temple. This building is not the temple of God. This is the temple of God. Amen? Have we forgotten what it means to reverence a holy God? Not just in our worship services, but in, even in our own lives. I love the way John puts it. John chapter 2, verse 17. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for thy house will consume me. David had a love for the temple. David had a love for the house of God. David loved to meet with God. In fact, he says in Psalm 27, verse 4, One thing I have asked from my Lord, that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. In Psalm 26, verse 8, O Lord, I love the inhabitation of thy house and the place where thy glory dwells. In Psalm 84, verse 2, My soul longed and even yearned for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my my flesh sing for joy to the living God. I love verse 17. His disciples remembered that it was written. In other words, back in Psalm. In fact, where's it found? Psalm 69, verse 9. Zeal for your house will consume me. You know what David was calling was doing? David was calling the people of God to true worship. And what he was getting back to was the resistance and hatred and hostility. He was re- he was rejecting that. The people were in the same condition that they were in Jesus' time. They were in the same condition that they were in Isaiah's time. It had not changed. But David is doing the best, his best, to call them back to faithfulness. And David says that they're mistreating me. They're hating me. And then he says, but zeal for your house has consumed me, and the reproaches of those who reproach you are falling on me. What does David mean by that? David means simply this, those things that bother God bother me. The things that make him mad make me mad. The things that hurt him hurt me. Why? Listen, I'm going to tell you something. You know you're growing in the Lord and you're becoming more mature in Christ when you hurt the same way that Jesus hurts over the same things. How can you say that, Brother Mark? I'll tell you this. I'm a parent. I would much rather take an illness than to have my son or my daughter be sick. I would much rather be sick than them. When my kids hurt, I hurt. When they're sick, it hurts my heart. When they're in pain, I feel the pain. Why? Because I love them deeply. And you know what hurts my kids? When they see their parents hurting. You know you're in love with Jesus when you hurt when he hurts. Amen? And you see the sin in this world, and you see how God has mistreated. You see how God is, is made fun of, or it's irreverent, or, you, or it's, it's not even close to being holy. And you sit there and you hurt because God's hurt. And you know that you're in love with Jesus. But if you don't hurt and you don't feel it, you need to check your love. Listen, I... I have to do what I do because I feel the pain of God. I preach not for my my pleasure, I preach for His. The reproaches that fall on you fall on me. When somebody criticizes, when someone criticizes the Lord, when someone dishonors the Lord, I feel the pain. I feel the discouragement. I feel the ache. There have been times I've walked into the, I've walked into Neyland Stadium and, and, and feeling the excitement of the football game is one thing, but then to sit there and when God just swept over me one time, I was sitting there looking at thousands of people. And in my heart, I was wondering, 
How many of them know Jesus? And all of a sudden you feel the, the pain of how many people that don't know Jesus are going straight to hell because they've never been shared the gospel. They don't know Jesus. And you look at the crowd and the face is there and you think, oh, the pain that Jesus must be feeling. He loves each and every one of them. We say, well, Brother Mark, what does this have to do with us? There's no temple anymore. There's no place to offer sacrifices. But as I said earlier, we are his temple. Those of us who know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior have an obligation to worship God in our bodies because he is in us. We are the temple of God. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 18, flee immorality. Every other sin that man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own, for you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. You want to worship God correctly? Love your wife the way Christ loved the church. You want to glorify God? You want to honor God? You want to live correctly? Then honor your husband the way the Bible says to. You want to worship God the correct way? Then be a person of integrity. Work your job. Do the job you're supposed to do. Work the hours you're supposed to be there. Be on time. Leave on time. Don't cheat the government. Don't cheat your job. Be a friend to those who are friendless. Be a neighbor to the neighbor that needs Jesus Christ and be a good neighbor. Treat those with respect. Show them love because Jesus said, love thy neighbor as you love yourself and gave himself for them. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength. This is the first and foremost commandment. This is what God has called us to do. That's worship. In church, when we don't, we bring dishonor to God. And we're no better than the money changers. We're no better than those that were cheating people. Have zeal for the house of God. Have zeal for worship. Have zeal for, for worshiping a holy and reverent God, a, a righteous God. And, and let us be faithful to see things the way he sees them. Ask for his eyes. Ask for his heart. Have compassion, but also have a righteous anger for those that do not. And let us speak the truth boldly. Amen? If you fire me over this, so be it. Amen? It's the word of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the zeal that you brought to the temple and how you, how you brought such righteous anger to those that were abusing worship. Father, what a miracle for you to drive everyone out. Oh, Lord, thousands of people being driven out of the temple because of your mighty act. So many things could have happened, but they didn't because you are sovereign. You are holy. You are righteous. And who can stand? Who can stand against you? You are sovereign. You are holy. May we worship you that way. Not just in our singing. Not just when we come on Sundays, but may we worship you like that every day that we live. In everything that we say, in every place that we go, in the words that we use, in the people we love, and even the people that we don't love. May we show love. Father, you give us a heart to love even the unlovely to be a ministry, to be a light in a dark world. Father, let us be that light, we pray. In Jesus' holy and precious name, amen. Would you stand with me?
If God has spoken to your heart this morning, the altar's open.